todos. Muito obrigado. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. As Carol mentioned, this is a very important topic, and we are going to be uh, we'll be keeping an eye on this in the next few years on Brazil, as the world will also, but uh, in how Brazil will relate to other countries and regarding the future of our planet. We've just been to the recent COP27 event. Many of you here were also there. So now I'd like to invite Franny Lotier. She's the CEO of Southbridge Investment Group invite her to the stage. Mr. Eduardo Pimentel, Vice Mayor of the City of Curitiba here in Brazil. Mr. Jorge Samek, he's the former General Director of Itaipu, binational company hydroelectric company, Mr. Enrique Pisaia, General Connect Coordinator for Strategic Alliances of Fon Plata. Mr. Temer Mansur, CEO of CCAB. And Mr. Francisco Carvalho, mayor of the city of Praia in Cape Verde. Uh, Carol, could you please come here for a minute just to make sure our one of our speakers has her headset. OK. Our talk here will be in Portuguese. Franny will speak English. She speaks Portuguese very well, actually. But we will um, get her a headset also in case she needs the translation. So I'd like to start out by asking each of our guests to tell us a little bit about their relationship to this topic and how we can learn a bit more from the examples that they have to share with us today. So I'm going to start down at that end with Mr. Francisco. Uh, we have quite a few guests here. So um, please. Uh, let's welcome Mr. Francisco. So tell us a bit about um, some of the experiences, experiences you've had in the city of Praia that uh, we can learn from. Well, good morning. Bonjour. I would like to thank the organization for the opportunity to be here for the invitation and Related to the experiences that we have had um, in the city government of Praia, I'd like to start out by telling you that we need to realize uh, the or uh, have understand about the place where I'm coming from. I'm uh, the president of the local um, chamber, the local government, so. I am uh, part of the local government, and also we are in the process of learning. I've been uh, in my pos current position for two years, and also learning, um, um, learning from the pandemic, which we all have faced over these last two years. So what we have been working on at in the city government of Praia uh, we've been concerned and tried to find 
the best way to use the resources that we have at hand. We've had um, some discussions here about resources, and we do have challenges when it comes to um, getting resources. And many city governments have issues and difficulty in accessing resources because many times um, the resources are um, channeled by the um, central government or the federal government. So before we talk about um, the concrete issues in relation to this um, renew about renewable energies, it's important to highlight this aspect. So we need to have mechanisms to access these resources that are adapted for the local government. So let me give you an example. We have um, the concern with trying to increase the implementation of renewable energies in our municipality. At the moment, we have a project that allows the creation of what we have called um, energy communities or energetic communities. Within this project, we uh, are trying to guarantee the access of solar energy to a small community in one of the neighborhoods in our city of Praia. And within that community, we have a network of these energy communities. We have a school that is going to, um, once it, it captures the solar energy, is going to start saving those resources um, in, uh, that would be paid for electrical energy. So also we have uh, a field uh, for where multiple sports can be practiced that we light um, with the solar energy, and we are trying to guarantee, once again, access of the community to that field and to the streets and also um, a residential area. So having this energy community with renewable energies is very important because then we are saving um, resources and also at the same time we have the participation of various actors, the school and uh, the sports community there, the population who lives in that neighborhood, in that uh, smaller area there, in that housing development. So that was that's a concrete example that I can share with you to show that even without having a huge amount of re financial resources, um, we are able to do some very concrete things. We can make people aware, raise awareness, and um, without the use necessarily of um, outside partners. Um, in our city government, we have this spirit, um, and we repeat this many times, that, uh, you know, having a car in motion and then we can't stop to change the, the tires of the car. We have to keep the car moving. So we are doing what we can, what is possible, bringing in various partnership and uh, organizations together, local and international. Welcome very much. Uh, I remember that you said something in 2019 that you talked about the need for Brazil to expand its uh, businesses and also different perspectives to Arab African. You have been acting in this area for two decades and also you go there and you come back uh, collecting these different perspectives. So what is your perspective? How can you reach this point? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation of Jean Bosco. Uh, professor, it's a great honor to participate in this um, amazing event. I always say that despite I live in Brazil, but I'm uh, from Africa. I was born in Cairo. My mother is from Tunisia, so I'm 100% African. And I'm proud of that. And I also am proud to see the connectivity or the connection between Brazil and the African continent, regardless it's from the south or with the north region of Africa. 
and you said that it's been 20 years, but it's actually 25 years of experience working in this world, uh, linking Brazil to the Arab world. And of course, uh, there are 11 Arab countries in the African continent. And I'd like to share with you today my experience after the pandemic, which was a very difficult phase. The entire world woke up on March 10th with a full lockdown. No one was even prepared for that. No one knew what was going to happen, what would happen. And Brazil, for the Arab world, we said, well, leave it with me because I will keep producing food. I will give you food for every four dishes or for family one dish one plate we have all the food from brazil produced by brazil so brazil took advantage of that especially when it comes to food security and also to show to the world that uh, brazil can substitute old players with the high level of uh, trustability and uh, the Arabs were great partners regarding that. Uh, the Arabs uh, became even stronger partners, importing uh, food, and also they showed this concern. They trust more in Brazil. I don't know if you know the data, but the Arab world invested a lot in the past two years in Brazil, especially when it comes to food security and infrastructure. And this uh, leads us to think that the pandemic was over suddenly, and the following day we had the Expo Dubai event, and it came suggesting, uh, presenting something that the world had forgotten, which is connectivity, right? To meet up with people, talk to them, hug them, right? This physical contact. I remember the first Brazilian delegation that we received, me and my colleagues that are here with me today, we received their, them in Dubai was a delegation from Paraná, a state here in Brazil. And there were 100 business people and the governor, governor and I like to talk about business people because this uh, was nice to see the sparkle in the eyes which was gone, right? We lost our sparkle in the eyes. We would look ourselves in the mirror and would take pills, right? Because we were kind of depressed. And especially when you travel a lot, you wake up and you get a cab and uh, we didn't have that anymore. We just had our balcony. So these were tough two years of pandemic. Why I'm saying that? Because somehow Allah, God, this uh, entity that is above, designed a perfect route between Brazil and the Arab world in the past two years. In the past two years, we can hear in great events in the Arab world, we concluded Expo uh, Dubai just after we had COP27 at uh, in Cairo, in Egypt. We concluded COP27. Now we have the World Cup. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who I'm supporting this World Cup, okay? <laughs> well, sorry to interrupt you. Let's say it's Brazil, okay? <laughs> we support Brazil. Uh, and we will finish the World Cup and we'll be prepared for the uh, climate event that happened in Saudi Arabia. We we'll conclude the climate summit and then we will start COP28 that will happen in Dubai. So look at the amount of connectivity and events that uh, obliges Brazil and the Arab world to meet in different ways. So please allow me to share with you two points that I just wanted to underscore here. Fernanda, our institutional affairs uh, director, uh, was with me in COP27 
and we participated in many events there in various areas in the institutional Brazilian uh, arena and we brought Arab think tanks, African ones, to talk about food security and sustainability and also the importance of the Arab Africa regarding to maritime uh, routes to provide food security as a logistics uh, center to also use these uh, spots as strategic points to export products. The important, uh, importance of uh, Morocco, Egypt and Tunisia uh, supplying Brazil directly uh, after Russia and Ukraine started this uh, war, just to make the war a bit more complex. And Brazil needed the substitute regarding fertilizers, someone to supply fertilizers. Today we have Morocco, Egypt, and uh, an Arab world that uh, is uh, Jordan as a great substitute to supply fertilizers to Brazil. And also we talked uh, outside the blue zone as uh, business people, and these are the nice events. We talked about the importance of renewables or renewable energy. Uh, there were people representing the oil and gas uh, sector and other uh, energy sectors and started to uh, attack the oil companies and how come you want to continue producing oil we want to talk about renewable energies we don't even have to consider that oil but the oil uh, has sustained the world and will sustain the world for the next 150 years and just to share share you a very clear example that i start to think how come people are bombarding this oil uh, company representative and then when it was my time I said well I want to congratulate this person for uh, receiving such great criticism but I want to talk about my origins my Arab origins I like to say that the biggest uh, oil producer in the world which is Saudi Arabia Arabia don't use uh, the oil as a commodity they use oil as a strategic currency to put on the table and impose themselves and they want to tell what they want they don't use oil to say i'm the largest oil producer in the world and also determine this or that no they're using oil to reinvest the money that is coming to other areas and other types of energies for example a silly one but this happened it is also happening as we speak Saudi Arabia is the largest oil producer and this is where you find the cheapest gasoline in the world they are building two electric cars factories not only one one using a French technology 100% and one Arab technology uh, uh, and the two of them are being built in Saudi Arabia so do they need electric cars no but uh, they need to demonstrate to the world that financial returns regarding oil can be deployed and used in other areas and I can be this guide or this example to the world we can talk about figures later on and I can give you more examples about it but 10 of the greatest public funds of global investments three of them are Arab ones Emirates, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia the three of them they are oil uh, producers but their funds are funds that are underscored because they don't invest in oil in the oil sector they have been investing more in sustainable sectors, in ESG, and they have been investing a lot in presenting this new Arab world to the external uh, map, including Brazil. Thank you very much. So, we'd like uh, 
he helped me to ask a question to Enrique regarding investments, funds, and this development. And Francisco talked about something important, that without this point, not a single city could uh, prosper, which is accessibility and people's participation in the discussions. So Enrique, welcome. Good morning. So how Fon Plata um, participates in the process where cities are important in this discussion. Thank you very much, Pablo. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Professor Jean Bosco for the, producing this event for 10 times. This is the 10th edition. And it's a very necessary forum, but not only that, it's uh, more than that, actually. So I've been talking to him a lot, and not only think about uh, Brazil and Africa, but Brazil, Africa plus, maybe include all the countries in the Mercosur region. I'd like to uh, greet all the panelists here. Uh, CEO of South Bridge Investments, Frenier, and Eduardo, the Vice Mayor of Curitiba, and the other ones. So, uh, in this World Cup uh, moment, the, now that I have the ball with me, I'll try to say good things, uh, just like the previous speaker said. So, what is Fon Plata? It's a multilateral development bank. We are kind of African bank, kind of World Bank, but that involves five countries. We work Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And our greatest focus and what sets us apart is that we focus in cities. We work with cities different from the arrangement in other banks that focus on federal infrastructure that provide funds to central governments. We focus mainly in cities, in provinces and states. So just to give an example, in Brazil, we work with 17 cities. And we work with many cities in Santa Catarina State, in Cascavel, in Paraná State, Itajaí City, Joinville, Criciúma City, Brusque, Palhoça, Florianópolis, all those cities. And also in the northern region, we are working with Belém in the Pará State and São Gonçalo do Amarante City in Rio Grande do Norte State. So... Our experience uh, so far is that we are about to become a bank and we have been undergoing this change for 10 years. We have been operating for 60 years and in the past 10 years we decided to make this move. We started to work across Brazil and also in Argentina before we were focusing only at uh, Prata Basin. We also work in cooperation with Mercosul, channeling the uh, funds, its funds. And also we operate in other countries, focusing on small cities, those that are more isolated. And the project that you talked about, schools and producing energy, we have a similar project uh, with the schools. And maybe in my next uh, panel I can talk more about it. This is a scalable type of project that we can take to all the countries of Fon Plata region and also to the African continent. We have been talking a lot with Professor Jean Bosco to integrate more these regions. I believe that we have uh, various realities inside Brazil, many Brazils inside Brazil. We have 54 countries inside Africa and each African uh, country there are other realities there as well so we have been acquiring a lot of experience in the past 10 years mainly and we have seen many realities that's why we have been working with isolated cities small medium-sized uh, cities with projects that go up to 50 60 million dollars and of course they adapt to the reality of those cities and to their needs to the needs of that region and the idea is to not focus on a single project. So what we see that is different from the big cities that are not Sao Paulo, Curitiba, they have this great institutional ability to execute projects. We can see that there are many things that lack, especially when it comes to knowledge, 
in this uh, new area of sustainable development. Small cities find it difficult to produce sustainable energy as well. So we provide the necessary training work with technical cooperation. We seek best practices and international partners as well. The African Bank, Asian Bank, European Bank, uh, CAFI, IDB. And we try to find this synergy um, between knowledge and produce knowledge and also the knowledge should stay there in the city, remain there. When we work with 100,000 inhabitants or isolated communities, this is very important. Uh, for example, we worked in a city called Corumba, which is border between Bolivia and Sao Paulo. We're talking about a city that is 500 kilometers away from this state capital and we have been working there to uh, provide these skills and work with these multiple uh, approaches in Sao Paulo in Rio you can have a subway with uh, 50 60 million dollars you focus on this uh, project but when you talk about a small city with 50 million uh, dollars you can work with sewage systems you can work with parks we can work with infrastructure so there are many possibilities so here we can uh, uh, talk about it and uh, we here open to have technical cooperation to explore these multiple projects that will provide this integral uh, uh, perspective of the city. Okay, thank you very much. So to paraphrase what Enrique said, I don't have the abilities of Richarlison. I don't think you have the skills of Vinicius Jr. But um, since Enrique was speaking of investments, since he kicked the ball to me, I'm going to kick the ball over to Franny now to talk about a little more about investments and the cities and for in terms of renewable energies. Welcome, Franny. Uh, introduction, uh, Paolo. Um, before I start speaking, I want to say thank you to Professor Joao uh, Monte for his partnership over many years and for having us once again in this forum. And also to wish uh, Tamer, I know you will be uh, celebrating for Brazil, but inside your heart, a little part of it may be for Tunisia as well. Um, and I say this because many of us here in the room, uh, we share a common history and a common culture with Brazil, and therefore we can celebrate Brazil even if we celebrate our own countries of origin. Uh, on your question, uh, Paolo, I was listening carefully to the remarks by the mayor of Praia and also by the, the remarks that were just made by uh, Tamer and Enrique. And I want to say three things. Uh, first, I'll start with renewable energy and then go to your question on investment. Why is renewable energy so important for developing and emerging economies? I think first, it's because of the word. It's renewable, meaning it doesn't get depleted. And therefore, we can use it over and over again. And we are very lucky that God has given poor countries a lot of renewable energy. So if you look at solar energy, we're very blessed in Africa to have a lot of sun. Most of the days are sunny in Africa. Therefore, using renewable energy becomes a very easy way to leapfrog development. The second is most renewable energy is modular. And therefore, you can put it, you can have a solar panel on the backpack of a child who is going to school to charge their mobile device, download the homework so that if they go home, even if they don't have electricity at home, they can do their homework. But you could also have a utility that like in Morocco, we have the largest park of uh, solar panels that are transmitting electricity to a utility that distributes it the same way as if they were using hydroelectricity or thermal uh, or nuclear power. And this modularity is very good for developing countries, first, because of innovation. You can innovate in small, modular steps, but also because of the growth process of developing countries. But then the third aspect, and I think this is really important because we talked about it a lot in Sharm El Sheikh, is the ability to have a, an ordered or structured transition. Because the whole world right now is dependent on the carbon economy, 
but as we move to meet the targets of staying below 1.5 degrees, I saw the flooding here in Sao Paulo, we all need to worry about that, otherwise our cities will continue to get flooded. Uh, we have an opportunity through renewable energy to structure that transition. So how does this link to investments? For the first point, uh, it makes it easier to invest in modular solutions. So if you take the example of Kenya, in Kenya, we moved immediately from traditional banking to mobile banking, and that was done using renewable electricity. So now you have your card, you can pay for your electricity without ex transacting, transacting cash, and you get your electricity also through your own solution, depending on how much you need on your house or on your small factory. And that pacing of the digital economy and the modular renewable energy economy was very easy to do because there was nothing there. So it's a, a lot easier to do. And the financing for that was arranged through a, a solution called Mkopa, which means to borrow in Swahili, and you can borrow for your electricity needs and use mobile payments to, to get your solutions there. If you take the example of uh, how you go from a modular solution to a utility solution, again, the investment uh, arrangements can be made because utilities need large-scale investments. But the people that they serve, the citizens in the cities and in the rural areas, they pay in monthly uh, or weekly utility bills depending on the way the country is structured. And being able to invest in the long term, and I'm sure at Fond Plata, because you lend to cities, this is, is, a, is a key aspect. You have to rely on the sources of revenues that those cities would have. Where do they get revenues? From taxes, land taxes, from parking fees, from fees on certain services and charges, and they come in a modular way as well, either monthly or yearly. So there's a nice way to match the profile of investments with the profile of revenue earning by the cities to allow both the modular solution and then this larger infrastructure solution for utility level uh, supply. And then for the last area, which is more around paying for the transition, because this is something that all cities have, will have to do and all countries will have to do. We just uh, ended a very successful COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh where we got an agreement on loss and damage. So the advantage of renewable energy is that we can structure it in a way that countries that did not contribute much to creating the problem that we are facing now in decarbonization can benefit from that loss and damage arrangement to actually pay for innovation, pay for the new forms of energy generation and help transition much faster into a, a modern economy. So I think those three areas also lend themselves very well to an investment structure, which we, for example, announced in Sharm El Sheikh, a $2 billion fund to reforest Africa. Africa has decided to reforest its forests because we are the remaining continent now that has the uh, single largest contiguous undisturbed forest in the world. And we want to keep it that way. And so we have to plant 128 million hectares of forests. And we want to make those forests available for carbon trading so that a farmer who has 10 trees can get a revenue stream from carbon trading. And that's what we announced in Sharm El Sheikh. So it shows you how you can link uh, loss and damage, massive investments in renewable energy, but also with modular investments that match the way citizens spend and the way cities generate revenues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, eu sou jornalista e já... Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a journalist and uh, I told Georgie, um, I in I've interviewed him many times before and I remember that he said there's no backup for the planet and we need to be aware of that as a planet. So. Um, considering your experience as an engineer at Itaipu and um, all of the other experience of experience of you've been through, what advances have you seen in the area of renewal energy and what else can you contribute here? Well, first of all, I'd like to greet all of my African brothers and sisters. I'd also like to greet uh, João Bosco, 
and the Brazil Africa Institute because um, I have been following your work for many years. Um, João Bosco is a bridge builder. We have two types of leaders. There is a leader that builds walls and another type that builds bridges. And that's uh, João Bosco. He is tireless in building bridges and um, bringing together, making these types of moments possible that will make our world better, will generate jobs and income. And he also has a very important characteristic that I admire. He is concerned with our planet and doing this in a sustainable way. I'd like to also greet my fellow panelists here. Our time is short, but um, during 14 years and three months, I had the opportunity to lead the largest hydroelectric company in the world, Itaipu, and um, the largest hydroelectric plant in power is in China. And after uh, seeing the success that we had in building Itaipu, the Chinese uh, president of that hydroelectric company, um, uh, we were able to use a clean um, process in building it. But the person who helped me most was an African from Sierra Leone and Mr. John Kella. He was, uh, for many years, he was the leader of Unidu, Unidu from Vienna that uh, deals with industrial development. So I had um, dozens of delegations from Africa come to visit us because when I started at Itaipu in 2003, we turned um, this largest hydroelectric in the planet into a development um, organization. And we had great partnerships with Fon Plata. Um, we received resources for many of the projects we developed from Fon Plata. But we started to develop those skills that we had in engineering to develop um, different areas, not only in Brazil, but in Paraguay. So we developed the technological park. We developed an electric automobile, a wind energy, biomass energy. So we have a lot to discuss between Brazil and Africa. So um, through Yon Kella, I was able to visit the largest um, hydroelectric potential um, that's not in China or Brazil, but it's in Africa. So it's twice, has twice the potential, hydroelectric potential of Itaipu. And we started to work in partnership and we know that one day this project is going to become a reality. You know, you have um, South Africa, which is the largest um, energy consumer in the African continent. So um, the engineering side, we've got that down already. From the financing standpoint, the energy generation will pay for itself. Itaipu was built completely from loans and it's being paid back from the energy it produces. In a few months, May 2023, we will pay off everything that was, uh, all the loans that were made for the building of Itaipu. So we are able to do this in cooperation with the state government of Paraná, bringing in the universities with their knowledge. And so um, we wish that we could have the largest agricultural production of our state in that area also, in the west side. In the past, we had corn and soy planted there. Today, we have um, corn, and then we have production of poultry, all types of poultry. So it's been the development of technology adding value, allowing us to develop small properties um, and where we have different cooperatives. 
And so we had different visits. And João Bosco has been, as I said, a tireless partner in trying to help us to bring together and partner with other um, institutions. I've been um, to Africa four times with Embrapa when they set up four offices there. And I'm very happy that at the end of the event today, we will have uh, Celso Amorim, who's been uh, chancellor. He is an expert. And during 10 years, he was part of the board of Itaipu. So um, he was able to also help us in partnering around the world, which was uh, something that we did. We worked on um, soil preservation. We received an international award for the best water preservation program. Um, ban Ki-moon, the um, UN general secretary, he doesn't go to visit uh, businesses. He visits countries, but he came to visit Taipu uh, twice. And we developed, uh, we implemented 17 of the SDGs because we wanted to um, show that if our business could do it, other large businesses could do that. And so large businesses have to care for the population, the education, the health, the development uh, of the youth, of the environment, preserving the planet. And that's the only way we can achieve a better world. I know that time is short here, but I would like to once again express my gratitude in name of Eduardo Pimentel, um, the vice mayor of our state of Paraná. Um, if, you, um, if you have the chance to go to visit our city, uh, Curitiba, that is well organized, that is very concerned with sustainability, uh, you need to visit Curitiba. I wish all of you a great day, and I am here willing for any questions if you have them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I could say that Curitiba is an amazing example for entrepreneurship, innovation, sustainability. And Eduardo, Curitiba shows us that the development of um, smart cities is green, right? Yes, for sure. I would also like to um, thank Mr. João Bosco and all of my uh, fellow panelists here. And um, uh, it's a colleague uh, who just spoke. We are from the same uh, city. My name is Eduardo Pimentel. I'm the vice mayor of the city of Curitiba. Our city is the capital of the state of Paraná. It's the next state after Sao Paulo, the first state on the map here of the south region. And we have a, a focus on agriculture in our state, but we are a, an urban center. We have two million, uh, population of two million um, in the greater metropolitan Curitiba area. And our city has gone through, um, had a great influence in the past of the African immigrants. So most of the largest uh, are the historic uh, center, the Church of Rosario in the center was built by African immigrants in honor of them of themselves. We have a park there that's called Zumbi dos Palmares that honors all of the African nations. And I think the largest infrastructure um, project in our uh, state from last year, which is the railway that connects our city to one of the best ports, um, most efficient ports of Paraguay the port of Paranagua was built by African immigrants, and it carries the name of one of these uh, African immigrants. And also the Hebosas neighborhood also is um, named after the African immigrants, and it's where we have a hub of innovation. We signed the C40 um, climate uh, agreement. So um, along with Paris and Stockholm, which agreed to reduce until 2040 our carbon emissions. And we have been working hard on this. Three of the major projects, uh, infrastructure project, projects, projects we have are for mo mobile, um, the urban mobility, so transportation. And we have um, 
international investment, but this investment was only possible because of our commitment to becoming sustainable. And we have the commitment to bringing renewable energies to our cities. Our um, city hall has various solar um, energy panels installed in the building. We have started work on the three largest public transportation terminals in the city that will be completely powered through um, solar panel energies on the roof. Um, and also our um, highway, um, interstate highways will also have solar energy. And so we are going to stop emitting seven tons of carbon in the planet with these initiatives. We are also working um, on our one of our landfills that is no longer in use. It can't be used for housing, for uh, trade. So what we are going to do there is to use that land for a solar energy farm. And we are going to generate enough energy which will power 60% of all the public buildings in the city of Curitiba. So we have this strong commitment to renewable energy. And um, the last project is uh, in one of the neighborhoods where we have 1,600 families that will be relocated from an area that uh, was uh, invaded along the a river bank, but we are building homes for these 1,600 families, and all of these new homes will be powered by solar energy with a sewage system to give them a dignified, uh, good quality of living. So the city of Curitiba has been working and investing to um, become a reference uh, and we were considered uh, received the award of the most innovative city in Brazil. And I was just recently in Barcelona, Smart City Barcelona event. And we were among the top six most innovative cities in the world um, with our uh, first public urban farm. And we have 142 um, gardens, city community gardens, trying to bring um, fresh, nutritious food to the families. But we have greater technologies. We uh, have the challenge of taking these renewable energy technologies into people's homes. But it's still an expensive technology. I believe Fon Plata can help us with that so that we can slowly begin to take solar energy into people's homes. So I'm very happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Pablo. OK, I am going to, um, I have a questions for Franny here. Um, so we have a problem of lack of water and based on public policies investing in renewable energies, do you believe that this could be a starting point so that this water problem can be overcome? Franny, please, uh, you and then Francisco. Thank you for that question. I think um, water stress is a topic we haven't spent enough time talking about. Uh, as we speak, uh, the world has either too much water, like we are seeing here in Sao Paulo, so you have to worry about flood damage and flood control, sewage and uh, storm drainage. But then we have other zones of the world where there isn't enough water. Uh, even a city like Cape Town, as rich as Cape Town, had to go to a model of managing today zero, where they would have zero water in such a well-advanced city. So I think water is an important uh, theme for us to talk about. Uh, there are three uh, important areas to discuss. First, how do we preserve it? Uh, we have limited amounts of uh, safe water, uh, clean water, so the, we, how to preserve it. The technologies to clean uh, water that is decontaminated or contaminated, including desalination technologies. And then the third is then how to manage the flows of water that come from uh, heavy rain, including rain harvesting. Uh, I think agriculture and uh, urbanization can be used to solve that problem because uh, agriculture needs water, 
and cities sometimes have too much of it, and, and the other way around in terms of competition for limited resources. And then the last thing I would say on the water side is we have now uh, given an example from Kenya. Again, I'm, I'm, I lived there for many years, so I have many examples from Kenya. But it's a small company that came up with a technology called MAJIK, M-A-J-I-K, which takes hydrogen and oxygen and makes water. So we do have scientific solutions to create water because hydrogen and oxygen is abundant. And therefore, as we go towards a hydrogen economy, we can also try to figure out how to solve the water problem. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding this uh, issue of uh, water scarcity, and also the migratory crisis that we live. And uh, Cape uh, Vigi is a great example. We lack a lot of water in my country. But we have to see uh, to this relationship between migrations or diaspora and the lack of resources to face the challenges that we have in our municipality and see them as an opportunity. Why do I say that? Because we have a very concrete measure there that we created a platform to engage the diaspora in favor of a prior municipality. And let me tell you more about this platform. It is a mechanism where we have there many projects. People submit their projects and the diaspora can invest in these projects. And these are projects that have two different formats. We have projects that have focus more to uh, be more profitable, of course, but also there are projects that have social uh, goals to develop the municipalities. And within these projects, we have projects that seek to address uh, solutions to water scarcity and also the construction, construction of urban vegetable gardens. So have to look at the current situation, trying to bring to the table new ideas and new combinations. We have problems and we are not reinventing the wheel, right? We are just trying to look at the problems as opportunities and diaspora, at least for my country, for the prime municipality, a huge source of uh, opportunity. If you want to ask any questions, uh, this is your time now. Just to compliment on what you said. Or I just wanted to follow up to what the mayor of Praia just said and to mention to you, um, because I sit on the board of the World Resources Institute, that at COP27 uh, we launched a fund called Aqua, like water, uh, which is supposed to help municipalities and cities to deal with the kind of problems that the mayor was uh, referring to. And this uh, fund will actually take community and municipality level problems of water and bring in solutions from the private sector, from government and from communities to fund them to deal with the water stresses that I just mentioned. So if you need more information about it, it will be on the website of either COP27 or uh, the World Resources Institute. And I think it would be a great opportunity for partnership between Brazil and Africa because the fund has just been launched and many of the examples we heard here today, including what Fon Plata is doing, what we heard from Curitiba and the solutions that are available here could be great examples to share with Africa as we just have launched the fund. So thank you for that opportunity. Anyone? Oh, please. Um, well, uh, thank you so very much. A great panel discussion. Uh, but I, I would like to touch on something uh, the mayor of Prior just spoke about, uh, which resonates very well with uh, what uh, we discussed uh, earlier. That is, how do we uh, get local solutions? You know, including relying on the diaspora to fund some of these, uh, contribute to uh, addressing some of these challenges. And I think it's a very uh, important, uh, great example that could be replicated across. Now, the question I have is, how do you uh, ensure that, uh, you know, 
the funds channeled by the diaspora is uh, effectively used, especially in the case of social project. So th th that's my question. But otherwise, thank you so very much for uh, the, the great uh, ideas. Thank you very much for your question and for the opportunity to uh, go a bit deeper into this. We created a company which is a public-private partnership between the uh, City Hall and a consulting group that understand these tools really well, these investing tools. So it's a public-private partnership that allows the creation of this platform and the management is done based on very strict uh, criteria and we are very much transparent about it all the funding are treated in the same way same way as any other investment of any other financial institution we provide full transparency and very strict about the accountability and it has to be like that because we want to uh, access the diaspora investment. But you can only do that if we can truly show that the City Hall is uh, trustworthy. And the only way to do that is to ensure full transparency in our processes. And we have some really concrete projects. We have a Facebook uh, page and everyone can monitor all the actions uh, with full transparency. Thank you very much for your question. I would like to thank everyone here in this panel. Uh, we ran out of time uh, and the time is up, so we have to wrap up here. So thank you very much for you all. I wish you a great day ahead. Now I hand over to Carol. Thank you.